It is the true believer's ability to shut his eyes and stop his ears to facts that do not deserve to be either seen or heard, which is the source of his unequaled fortitude and constancy. He cannot be frightened by danger, nor disheartened by obstacle, nor baffled by contradictions, because he denies their existence. Eric Hoffer, The True Believer. Hi there, and welcome back. Let's continue our servantine journey through history's greatest novel. We are in the penultimate chapter. At the beginning of chapter 73, Don Quixote turns morose and superstitious. He overhears two boys arguing, one of whom says, you'll never see her in all the days of your life. He interprets this to mean that he will never see Dulcinea again. Similarly, in early modern Spain, the sudden appearance of a rabbit was an ominous event. A hare came fleeing toward them, followed by many greyhounds and hunters, and fearful she came to hide and crouch at the feet of the grey. Sancho grabs the hare and offers it to Don Quixote, who reacts in horror. Malum signum, malum signum, the hare flees, the greyhounds follow, Dulcinea will not appear. Note this amazing trick performed by Sancho in relation to his gray, Cervantes maintains the Apollyon motif to the very end. Once again, Sancho is skeptical regarding metaphysical superstitions. He claims that offering Don Quixote the hair should be a good omen. He also asks the boys what they were arguing about. They were arguing over a cricket cage. Notice how Sancho purposefully counters Don Quixote's panic by purchasing the cage and placing it in his master's hands. Sancho took out four cuartos from his pocket and gave them to the boy in exchange for the cage, and then he placed it in Don Quixote's hands. This symbolic moment at the end of the novel recalls previous episodes, Don Quixote's journey home in a cage at the end of part one, and Don Quixote's triumph over the caged lions in Don Quixote part two, chapter 17. By contrast, there are no enchantments or lions here, just crickets and a prosaic commercial exchange. But Cervantes saves his greatest symbol for last. This symbol signals Cervantes' understanding of his art of the novel as social satire in conjunction with the modernization of the classical picaresque. In other words, hatred of the Inquisition, plus the metamorphosis of the Apollyon ass as a sign of the humanity of others. Did you know? The most famous image of the Renaissance that merged knighthood with melancholy was Durer's engraving, Knight, Death, and Devil, 1513. When our heroes come across the priest and Carrasco, who are praying in a field, the narrator emphasizes that Sancho has dressed his ass like a victim of the Inquisition. And it's worth noting that Sancho Panza had thrown his buckram tunic painted with flames of fire, the one that they had made him wear at the Duke's castle the night that Altisidora came back to life, over the gray and over the bundle of weapons so that it might serve as a coat of arms. And having also placed the pointed hat on his head, this made for the most original adornment and transformation that an ass has ever seen in the world. Notice how complex this symbol is. It's not just a mockery of the Inquisition, because Sancho has covered the bundle of weapons with the flame-covered robe. The symbol relates the institutional persecution of heresy to the art of war. The question is, is the Inquisition a more civilized alternative to war, or is it simply war by another means? Now the labor theme resurfaces. As he did at the end of part one, Sancho explains to his wife that he brings money. I bring money, which is what's important, earned by my own industry and without harm to anybody. There's ambivalence here, of course, because Sancho took 10 escudos from the bandit Roque Guinart, because his 200 escudos from the Duke seemed to signal governmental corruption, and because the lashes he sold to Don Quixote were fraudulent. Moreover, his ass, dressed like a victim of the Inquisition, suggests that the entire Spanish economy is tainted 
by the unjust treatment of conversos and moriscos. Note also how this contradicts Sancho's previous claim that he returns home not very rich. Nevertheless, his statement that he earned his money without harm to anybody makes the point that lucre achieved through violence is exactly what the novel satires. Quixotic mission. How many escudos does Sancho have at the end of his adventures with Don Quixote? A, 310 escudos. B, 3,300 escudos. C, 1,000 escudos. Correct answer, A, 310 escudos. This penultimate chapter ends with a review of the pastoral theme. Don Quixote explains his plans to his friends and family. He had in mind to become a shepherd that year and to spend his time in the solitude of the fields where he could give free rein to the expression of his amorous thoughts while devoting himself to that virtuous and pastoral occupation. The general impression here is that a return to calm attention to one's local environment should supersede violent expansionist adventure. Thus, the curate and Carrasco approve so that he would not once again leave the village on chivalric campaigns and hoping that over the course of that year he could be cured, they consented to his new interest and approved his madness as reasonable. These anti-imperialist and anti-colonialist aspects of Don Quixote greatly impressed later philosophers like Voltaire and Ortega y Gasset. Nevertheless, as we saw in the cases of Grisostomo, and Eugenio from part one, the pastoral still contains the seeds of rivalry and violence. Thus, the comical excesses of the pastoral remain. Carrasco, let each of us choose the name of the shepherdess that he plans to celebrate in his verses, and let us not leave a single tree, as hard as it may be, without her name carved and inscribed on it, as is the usage and custom among lovesick shepherds. By contrast, perhaps the sagest advice of all comes from Don Quixote's niece and housekeeper, who urge him to come to his senses once and for all. The niece is distraught. Here we were thinking your grace had reduced himself again to living at home quietly and honorably, and now you want to get involved in new labyrinths? The housekeeper is insistent. Stay at home, attend to your estate, confess often, give alms to the poor, and let it be on my soul if that does wrong by you. Notice how well their advice accords with the model of Diego de Miranda, the knight of the green coat. That's all for now. What do you think will happen at the end of our novel? If you liked this video and want to continue learning more about the knight errant Don Quixote de la Mancha, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel here. Also, you can enroll in our free online course on Don Quixote by clicking here.